picking up from where we left off last night, the decades and centuries following the success of the Plymouth Colony saw tens of thousands of people move to the American colonies. By 1691, Plymouth and Massachusetts Bay that united into one larger colony, and then following that, Virginia became an official royal colony in 1624, Maryland in 1632, Rhode Island and Connecticut in 1636, Carolina established in 1663, they would later divide into North and South in 1735, <laughs> New York, New Jersey, and Delaware all established in 64, Pennsylvania in 1681, and finally, Last but not least, Georgia came a few years later in 1732. Kind of one of those last states to join, you know, that you kind of look like that in Oklahoma, right? So the population of the 13 colonies went from 1,980 in 1625, when it was just New England and Virginia, to 2.4 million people by 1775. It was truly a place of freedom and prosperity and opportunity to succeed. London, 3,000 miles away, two months by boat. Parliament ended up having little to do with what was going on, the day-to-day -day functions of the colonies. And so the locally elected governments, though the governor may have had to been approved by the king, didn't really matter. They ran themselves here at home, supporting the people as it brought profits to the empire. And things were, times were very, very good. It provides a great lesson for history. One of our American values that the less the government is involved in the people's lives, the more they accomplish and they prosper. That's part of the foundation of our country. Events, however, were set in motion in the 1750s that would forever change the current landscape of the colonies and the mother country. 75,000 French traders and soldiers began traveling the rivers of the western frontier, establishing commerce with the natives, marrying some of the natives, establishing very long and strong alliances, especially when they married the daughters of the chiefs. The 1.5 million British colonists, meanwhile, are mostly concentrated near the coast. There's a, there's a big buffer between these two growing, expanding empires with a large uh, population of Native Americans in between there, but the Natives are growing more and more fond of the French. In the spring, 1753. Paul Marine de la Merlue, it's French, led 2,000 men to build forts all along the St. Lawrence, the Allegheny, the Ohio, and Mississippi rivers. Well, this generates a little bit of concern for everybody, especially those who are prospectors, those who are looking to acquire territory for future expansion and trade and commerce and all that kind of stuff, especially if they were invested in the Ohio Company. That would include Virginia's governor, Robert Dinwiddie. Don't snicker. It's not polite. And two half-brothers to George Washington, Augustine and Lawrence. They are heavily invested in this. Now, Lawrence is going to end up dying of tuberculosis before any of the following events took place. And the uh, long sought of cousin of George <laughs> <laughs> not uh, just a couple years away from him. So, yeah, not quite there. The new French forts, though, present great trouble for the fur trade expansion in the Ohio Company and the prospecting of property. And so in October of 1753, Governor Dinwiddie dispatches the 21-year-old Major George Washington of the Virginia Regiment to go talk to the French 
and to ask them, warn them, to leave Virginia Territory. Because you understand that Virginia Territory on their maps went all the way to the Mississippi at the time. Yeah. In fact, some maps kind of just showed the British colonies going all the way off the map, pretty much to the ocean. That was their understanding. That's what their charter allowed them to expand westward. So they're in Virginia Territory. Washington is also a very accomplished surveyor. So his ability to maneuver and go throughout the land and chart everything and map everything is you know, a, a great advantage to him. So he and the regiment arrive at Fort de Limbeau on December 12th. General Saint Pierre invites Washington in for dinner. They have a very lovely evening. They dine on fine cuisine, this French cooking, you know. So it was very good everything. And then Washington presents his terms, say we would very much like for you all to depart and move out these forts and go on so we can do our expansion as we have those claim to this territory, to which the general says, well, I'm sorry, we can't do that, so you will have to, uh, bounce, you know, I don't know if that's French or not, but so they, and so they, Washington says, very well, I'll take that back to our country, and they depart, that's it, that's how the meeting goes, okay? Now, um, I forgot to bring it in, on the table, on the display table in the back, uh, on the other side of Walter, in the middle, it's okay. Um, in the middle is a uh, is a book, okay, that we want, yeah, go ahead and do justice. Go right ahead. He's like itching to go get it. So yeah, go get it. It's right there in the middle of the table. It's on display there. No, nope. the other table. To your right. The table to your right, right there. There you go. The, the book on this, yeah, that's it. Your, let me get this right. Your great, 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 Great grandfather's history book is what this is. Yeah, yours. That's right. Okay. Yeah, hold the page right there. Very good. Okay. This belongs to. Thank you, bud. My son Justice. There you go. So. You can go sit down. My um, Anthony Rove, Stringtown, Illinois, Richland County, Illinois, August 9, 1890, is when this book was purchased. Uh, from uh, the drug books and wallpaper store there in Albany, Illinois. And uh, it was then passed on to his son, John. It was then passed on to my mother, and it was given to me. And so this was my great-great-grandfather's history book that he had in school. And here, on uh, this page, it talks about, page 82, it talks about how when they left, it was clear that France was determined to hold the ter territory explored by the Euro de La Salle and Marquette. The shore in front of the fort was even then lined with canoes ready for an intended expedition down the river. Washington's return through the wilderness, a distance of 400 miles, though, was full of peril. I did not know this until I read this history book. The streams were swollen, the snow was falling and freezing as it fell. The horses gave out, and he was forced to proceed on foot. Washington was, and a couple of days with him. With only one companion, he quitted the usual path, and with the compass as his guide, struck boldly out through the forest. An Indian, lying in wait, fired at him only a few paces off, pretty much point-blank range, but missed, and then was captured. Attempting to cross the Allegheny on a rude raft, they were caught between large masses of ice floating down the rapid current of the mid-channel. Washington thrust out his pole to check the speed, but was jerked into the foaming water. This is December, with ice in the river. Swimming to an island, he barely saved his life. Fortunately, in the morning, the river was frozen over and he escaped on the ice. And it was perfectly fine. No hypothermia, no nothing. Amazing. So, and we'll come back to this history book in just a little bit. He goes back home, he arrives May 1st, 1754. He was then sent with uh, Virginia forces, the governor orders him, to proceed to Fort Duquesne at the fork of the Allegheny River and the Monongahela River. Today, this area is known as Pittsburgh, where the two confluences of the river come together. On May 24, about 60 miles out, Indian scouts alert Washington to nearby French troops, and so he orders the immediate and hurried construction of Fort Necessity. The fort was quite an impressive feat. It was 
They glorified the fence. With a storehouse in the middle. Completed on June 3rd. A few days later, a hundred British regulars joined them as they were coming in reinforcement there. And they look at the board and say, well, we're going to camp out next door. <laughs> and so, it's like, nah, we're, we're good. Well, this would have given Washington a force of 400 soldiers. However, of his nearly 300 Virginians, a quarter of them were sick. And then Colonel Joshua Fry of the, uh, of the British regulars had actually died in a skirmish back on May 31st. And so this led Washington to assume full command of the entire regiment, which promoted him to colonel. Well... Led by General Louis Cordon de Villers, the French attacked on July 3rd with 600 French regulars and Canadian militia and around 100 Indians, so 700 versus 300. The attack began at 11 a.m. and continued until 8 o'clock p.m. And a heavy rain came down, flooded the trenches of Fort Necessity. Washington's men had to get out of that because it was very wet. So they had to fire up over the walls because they couldn't get in a good position to shoot, whereas many of the Native Americans had climbed up into the trees and were firing down into the fort. Many, much of their ammunition got wet, and it was just, it was not good. Finally, the French general sent a soldier under a white flag to go and speak to Washington and sign a truce. After a few hours of negotiations, Washington and his regiment were allowed to leave the next morning, July 4th, 1754, and return to Virginia. Amazingly, Washington had lost only 31 men. The French, three. Upon their return, the Virginia House of Burgesses voted an official public thanks to Washington and his men for their brave stance against the French. The French, however, now controlled the entire Ohio Valley, and they began plundering any English traders who dared enter the region, and there was no resistance against them. Once news of this reaches England and France, this is when things begin to spiral out of control. The English send an expeditionary force to dislodge the French stronghold in what they were calling New France. Oh, well, we're not going to stand for that. So they send their expeditionary force. The French find out they're going to send six regiments of reinforcements for them there. The British find out about that and decide they're going to send their fleet in February of 1755 to block the French from sending their troops. But when they arrive, it's too late. The French forces have already left. And so the British ships that are just sitting there, they, their mission is going to happen now. They just begin to attack and harass any French ship they could find. And this greatly upset the uh, French as they continued on for an entire year. And so finally, Britain officially declares war on France in May of 1756. And Britain's ally, Prussia, mostly a German state, will join them. Well, hey, let's get in on this. France has allies. Austria and Russia join them and declare war on the others. And so this is what brings about the Seven Years' War it was known back here as the French and Indian War, and it really could be regarded as the first ever global world war. All because George Washington had dinner with a French general. I mean, that's it. That was the beginning of all this. He was at the helm of all this beginning. Well, you now have a world war on your hands. The French strategy is let's just let's just keep what we've got. Mostly France. Because when you go back in history, there have been many a times when the English took control of France. And we don't want that to happen. So their, their primary mission is just let's not lose our own homeland. That's it. Whatever ends up happening in the colonies, that's fine. We'll fight and try to keep it, but that's it. Britain's strategy is to use its navy to attack ports and harbors and quickly move its troops all around to aid its militias especially the colonial militias. And their goal was to take all of North America and India. 
why is India so important? Tea. And, and yes, what was that? Tea. Oh yes, God save the king. Oh yes, the tea. The tea, India, you gotta have the tea. You're all not getting as excited as you are about the tea here. <laughs> it's all about the tea. So they're gonna get India. Come back next time, okay? In two weeks, for, and, and you'll find out why the tea is so important, okay? You don't want to miss out on tea. So, that's their goal, uh, all, as well as defending their other territories. So, back in America, April 1755, recently arrived General Edward Bratton invites Colonel George Washington to come out of retirement. Well, he's only in his 20s, but that's okay. He's had enough. He wants to be home, okay? And you might find out later why he wants to be home so bad. Um, he was enjoying the farming life at Mount Vernon, and well, I just tell you, he got married. That's why he wanted to stay home. He just got married. And uh, he had inherited uh, vast amounts of property because of his half-brother Lawrence's death. But out of his incredible sense of duty, he accepted the general's invitation. And so Washington's mother, her name was Mary, she's not happy about this. She's like, what are you doing going back into battle? You scared me out of death last time. You were completely surrounded with Indians shooting down in the door. You cannot go back. What are you doing to me? Mothers, right? Okay. They let your son go up there. Well, he replies to her, quote, The God to whom you commended me, madam, when I set out upon a more perilous errand, defended me from all harm. And I trust he will do so now. Do not you. I still don't think she was happy that he went, but he went. And Braddock's forces included two Irish regiments that he had brought, plus the local militia. And they set out from Fort Cumberland, Maryland, on May 29th, with a force of about 2,100. The entire expedition, though, with all the wagons, cannons, supplies, and men stretched four miles long. So their progress is quite slow, as you can imagine. They were frequently having to widen the road, because these are just little dirt horse paths, okay? That they were, so they had to keep widening the road, cutting trees, moving stumps all the time to move the wagons and the cannon and all that, and all the artillery. And Braddock is not pleased at this slow pace. He wants to get them to their their mission about the jacket, which is to take Fort Buchanan. And but they're moving so slowly. Washington also is not doing too well. He's got sick. He has severe headaches, fevers, he's got chills, and it's not good. He, he's just not feeling good at all. He's just like, this leaves me out of the So what they decide to do is okay, let's divide up into two groups. A group of fighters, of, of infantry, that we can just move a lot quicker. All the supplies, you guys can follow us up and you catch up whenever you get there. Okay? So that's what we're going to do. June 19th, Braddock leaves the flying column, that's what they call it, a 1300, taking along Washington, who has to ride in the hospital wagon. Now you have headaches and body aches if you get to ride in a wood wagon on unpaved road. Oh, that's going to be nice. He felt every single bump on the road. Along the way, though, there were some Shawnee and Delaware Indians who offered their assistance. They weren't too fond of the French. And Washington's like, this is fantastic. That's exactly what we need. They know the land better than anybody. They will have their scouts out. They'll be able to tell us if there's any impending dangers or anything like that. That's wonderful. So he says, absolutely, this is great. Braddock says, well, what do we need them for? We are the British, we are the king's troop. We don't need their help. Washington's like, no, oh, no, yes, we do. Absolutely, we do. We need their help. Those good. He's like, oh, no, fine, they can come along. He won't listen to them. He won't entertain them. He won't talk to them. He's the cold shoulder. They finally get fed up and they leave. Washington's like, come here. Okay, you're the general, and I'm the colonel. But understand, you cannot do that. They are essential. If we get an offer like that again, you've got to take it. Then you could have just blown. Up. We could just make this a whole lot easier with their assistance. Oh, right. So they go on. 
July 7th, they come to within 12 miles of Fort Duquesne. On July 8th, more friendly Indians arrive, again offering their assistance. Washington begs and pleads with Braddock to take up their advice, their, their help, because warfare in the woodlands is quite a bit different from the open field warfare of Europe. You can't see your enemy. They're behind the trees. They don't just line up in a nice pretty line for you to shoot at. <laughs> Braddock has the same reaction. Scorns their help and they leave. July 9th, they march along the Monongahela River to within 10 miles of the fort. Washington describes the scene as journal. says, quote, every man was neatly dressed in full uniform. The soldiers were arranged in columns and marched in exact order. The sun gleamed from the burnished arms. The river flowed tranquilly on the right, and the deep forest overshadowed them with solemn grandeur on the left. Officers and men were equally inspired with cheering hopes and confident aspirations. And they had reason to be. They had, according to their intelligence, the fort, they found out, was lightly defended. So they're thinking they're going to just overwhelm them and just walk right in. And it was, until a Canadian reinforcement of French troops had arrived, bringing their number up to 1,600, including all their Native American allies. So they set out a force of 108 French regulars, 146 Canadian militiamen, 637 Indians, for a combined force of 891 versus the 1,300 British that are on their way. The French forces were late in setting up their ambush, and so Lieutenant Colonel Thomas Gage had been sent out with just a small little group to kind of walk 